names that you like, you know, it'll be fun. But I remember that Dick Van Dyke, his real name was Richard. And I know a guy named Bob, his real name was Robert. And I knew a guy, sort of, named Simon, whose name got changed to Peter. And I want to look at him this morning just a little bit, in a little bit. But let's pray together, please. Father in heaven, thank you again for our many, many, many blessings and for family and for letting us be together at times. And we thank you for the blessing of food we get to eat too much of and we get to enjoy just the fellowship. And thank you for letting us be here this morning to take of your supper that reminds us of what Jesus has done for us. Father, help us never forget. And bless us as we open your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is a, is a very beautiful person. That's where an amen goes. Because he takes broken people and he uses them. Uh, there is a really neat story in the New Testament about Jesus calling a man named Simon. He... Uh, his name originally meant a tumbling stone, a small one that would be in the river and it would just roll down with the tide. But later, as he got to know him, he called him Peter. And the word name for Peter is a rock that is really solid. And I think sometimes Peter wanted to go by Simon. In fact, in Matthew 16th chapter, when Peter was talking to Jesus and the apostles were all around and Jesus asked them, who do men say that I am? Peter came out with the phrase that was so important, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, Simon, I'm going to call you Peter because what you just said is the foundation of the kingdom of God on the earth. It was his confession that became the announcement that became the rock or the foundation stone for all things important to us in Christianity. Jesus is the Christ, the one prophesied from times of old, the one promised to us that would come and take away the sins of mankind. He is the one that is our Savior and our King. But Simon was an interesting character as we have been looking for the last few months about things that Simon did. I remind you of things like when he walked on water. Uh, Jesus was walking to the apostles across the lake and Simon said, I want some of that. And Jesus said, come on. And he got out and he walked on the water as uh, best he could. And then he looked down and said, I can't do this. I'm walking on water, but you can't do that. And he started to sink. And Jesus reached out and grabbed them and took him into the boat. Simon, that is what his parents called him growing up was the guy who cut off the soldier's ear at the crucifixion we looked at a couple of weeks ago. He said, I'm ready to die for Jesus. I'm going to fight the soldiers. And he cut off the guy's ear. His name was Malchus. He was a high priest servant. And he attacked him. I think he was trying to cut off his head. And he just got the ear. And then Jesus picked it up and stuck it back on, which I just love that story. Blood on the shoulder and the ear working perfect. It's interesting to look at Peter when he, in John chapter 18, which we looked at a couple of weeks ago, where, where Peter denied Jesus three times. I never knew the man. I never knew the man. And the echoes of that probably tormented him for life. Except Jesus comes and talks to Peter in John 21. We looked at last week when he goes to Peter and he says, Peter... Let's go for a little walk, just a little ways away from the other apostles. You can still see them. You can see John, the one that Jesus loves. And he asked him, Simon, do you love me? I can only barely handle the feelings that come up inside of me when I think about what Peter was thinking that moment. I could say, yes, I love you, it's obvious, but he knows he just finished denying him three times before the crucifixion. And when he says, Lord, you know what, I do love you. And then Jesus asked him again, do you love me? Oh, that one hurt. I just told you I do, and you're asking me again, are you trying to see if I'm sincere? And he said, I love you. 
And then Jesus did it. Simon, do you love me? Powerful, powerful questions to ask him because now this broken man has to realize that Jesus wants him to love him because each time he asked him, he said, feed my lambs, care for my sheep, feed my lambs. I have a job for you to do, Peter, and part of the process you've gone through will make you a better person to feed my broken lambs and to care for my sheep. I don't know how many of you in your lifetime have been called ugly names. Sometimes people in the world call us ugly names, and we don't like it. Sometimes the devil calls us ugly names, I'm sure, in front of Jesus. Sometimes our parents and sometimes our friends who get angry with us. And oftentimes in the world, the world calls us ugly names. But Jesus calls us something different. And it's for his voice that we need to pay attention to. Now we just finished looking at John 21 where Jesus denied Jesus three times and he asked him, do you love me? And now we're going to look at him. He said, feed my sheep. Peter has a responsibility through the, through the involvement with Jesus to feed and care for the lambs of God. And so we're going to look at 1 Peter this morning, 1 Peter chapter 1. Now, Simon Peter is going to say some things in this text that are just profound. He says to him, I have come to the place where my healing has occurred, and I know who I am, even though I'm broken. I am Peter. I am an apostle, a chosen vessel to speak the words for the King of Kings. I am Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ. And now he's going to address the letter. That would be on the outside, you know, the address on the outside of our envelopes, on that scroll. But when you open it up, the top line tells who it's to. To God's elect. He calls us the elect. The ones who are chosen, the ones that are blessed by calling to the exiles in this specific category. Exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. He's talking to people who have been called by God, who are broken people. But they've been called and redeemed, and now they belong to Jesus. They are the chosen. They're the ones that God selected, that he gave, he gave his Holy Spirit to, that paid attention, accepted this gift of the indwelling of God and obeyed him to the obedient to Jesus, Christ, the Christos, sprinkled, Peter says, with his blood. When I read that and I remember that Peter was there, and that Peter saw the blood, the real blood that was shed, and he talks about the cleansing power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about something he really knows firsthand. It took this precious, precious blood to take away the sins of those who have been chosen. And we are now, as children of God, thankful beyond measure for the forgiveness and redemption that's given to us. So Peter is feeding the sheep when he writes these because the sheep and the lambs of God's people, who Peter is trying to take care of as an apostle, a shepherd of the kingdom, are going to read these words like we're doing it now. And we're going to be fed by it. And we're going to grow out of here this morning having been blessed by the calling that God has given us and that Peter has written down because he was told to when he told him he loved him three times. He says, grace and peace be yours in abundance. We need grace. We need more grace than we can even gather up on our own in any way, shape, or form. But we have this grace that comes from Jesus Christ for broken people who have done horrible things. And Peter knows what it's like to have been broken and to break Jesus' heart because he was there when he denied him the third time and Jesus looked at him. And that glazed eye that fell on his face, Peter knew he was broken. He was not a huge foundation stone. He was a pebble just rolling in the tide. 
But now he understands by the grace and the power of God's sprinkled blood of Jesus on the cross that he has been redeemed. And he wants us to realize that God's children are redeemed. That we are no longer the broken, sinful, dark souls we used to be, although we continue to struggle all the time. But because of the grace of God, we have peace. The peace that comes from the power of the Almighty. It's a great story that Peter is saying. He's feeding us. He's feeding God's sheep to make us healthy in our understanding. He's calling us by names here that are very precious. Our names have been changed, really. We are Christians, followers of him. We are children of God the Father. So he says, grace and peace to, you be, in, to be yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I can almost hear him singing those words. He's saying them, but he's saying them in a way that just really trying to make a point. Praise, praise, praise. Amen. Be to the God and Father of Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth. He made us new people. He has cleansed us from our old sins, and he has given us a living hope. A living hope, not a dead hope, but a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And Peter is saying, I saw this Happening. Eyewitness to the fact. And so he's kind of gathered it up, chopped it up just right, made it edible for us to be, so we could consume it, this understanding of the redemption of a sinful soul in the presence of the Almighty. He's given us a new birth. We've been born again. And we live in a living hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If he hadn't resurrected, it would all be over. But the devil couldn't keep him down. And Peter said, no, did I see him while they whipped him? I didn't just see him when I denied him. I saw him when they nailed him. I saw his blood pour out. I saw him put into a tomb. I saw him a resurrected king. I saw him when he redeemed us all. And he told me, tell the people, because they need this to survive. And Peter feeds us. He says, and to the inheritance. In verse 4 of chapter 1, he talks about an inheritance that is just incredible. An inheritance that comes from our Father. An inheritance that gives us a home in heaven that we can't pay for. He gives us a life that goes eternally that we can't maintain. It is an inheritance that comes because Jesus Christ died on a cross for us. That he gives us an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. I have nothing in my life that hasn't begun to spoil or fade. Everything you have, everything you get, everything you possess eventually will spoil and fade and disappear. But this one thing, it is this inheritance that comes by the blood of Jesus as a gift to his children. My Father in heaven loves me. This I know because Peter's gospel tells me so. Thank you, Peter, for telling me. This inheritance is kept for you in heaven, who through faith are shielded by God's power. I love that phrase, shielded by God's power, because when the arrows begin to flow, uh, fall from the devil's schemes that come at Christians, we have a shield around us. We'll, they'll hit and deflect because God is caring for us spiritually. He says he shields us by God's power until the coming of the salvation that, that is ready to be received in the last time. We have a, a covering that doesn't run out. We don't go out from under and we have this covering of the power of God as Christians. It will last until our last breath and beyond. We'll step from the protection of God spiritually into his kingdom of heaven eternally. And it will last until the coming of the salvation will be revealed in the last time. A lot of people think the last times are now. They think the last times are happening around us and they may. They just may be. But maybe they're not. 
But I know one thing beyond a shadow of a doubt that God's love and his care and his protection for us as Christians, as Christian people, will last until the last day of this earth occurs and we go to be with him. We'll have no gap in between. Throw your rocks if you need to, Satan. I have a covering. In this, in all this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And if you haven't had any trials lately, you haven't been out in the out in the world walking around. You haven't listened to the news, you haven't been among people, you haven't heard people hurting, you haven't known that people suffer. We will suffer for a little while. And I love it that he said we will suffer and didn't stop there because he said we'll suffer for a little while and then God will take care of it from there on out. You'll have to suffer for a little while, some, all kinds of griefs and troubles, but that is not the end of it, all of it because the kingdom of God is coming and his salvation is coming. And we have to just suffer for a little while. And the reason we suffer for a little while is kind of interesting as he describes it here. In all this you are greatly rejoiced, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come, these trials, these sufferings, these grief that have come, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, even gold will be perishing, but these trials are to express or to explain or to build and it help us to realize that our faith being genuine will last forever even though gold will burn up these things that god gives us may result in the praise and the glory and the honor of jesus christ when he is revealed god says you go through these struggles because i want the people of the world who don't have the covering that covers them this power of god that covers them when they suffer they they see the need for a covering and they see people who have a covering because they're filled with joy even though they're suffering. And his grace and his power will be revealed in the world around us. Though you have not seen him, you love him. When I got to verse 8 down here and talking about loving Jesus, we haven't seen him. Peter is looking at us in the future and saying, those people are going to love Jesus. And they didn't even see him. And Peter saw him. And then he had to tell them three times he loved them because he turned his back and he was afraid and he did horrible things of denying the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Jesus let him say, yes, Lord, you know I love you. So he's talking to those of us who, who love him. Don't you see him and believe in him and are filled with the inexpressible and glorious joy? We had Thanksgiving this week and a lot of us said thank you to the Lord for all kinds of blessings in earthly ways and spiritual ways. I think we should do that more often. We need to tell the Lord how thankful we are for all that he does for us. But I, I want us to think for a moment about expanding that a hundredfold. Because he says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And are filled with an inexpressible, overflowing, always growing, and glorious joy for you are receiving the end result of faith, which is something very special, the salvation of your souls. So this man named Simon, who was a tumbling stone through his lifetime, became solid as a rock in his faith and began to feed the sheep of God because God told him to, even though he was broken. There's a song in the book, 588 Sinners, Jesus Will Receive. And I'm not going to sing it because I don't do that, but I do it in private. Singers, sinners, Jesus will receive sound this word of grace to all who are who the heavenly path will lead. All who linger and all who fall, sing it over, sing it over again. Christ receives sinful men. Christ receives sinful men. Peter, of all people, understands that extremely, extremely well. It is important for us to realize that we are the cho a chosen race of people. That God has told us that we are chosen by him. 
to follow him. That we have been given a very special calling if we will listen. He says about us a couple of places in the New Testament. Peter writes that I am the clay and he's the potter. He's the one that forms us if we let him form us. Jesus works with broken people. He worked with Mary Magdalene, a broken lady. Really broken. And some of us might identify with that. He worked with a man named Thomas, who doubted him in every way possible at the last moment when it was really important until he saw the holes in his hands and the hole in his side. Peter was a broken man. We talked about it already. But now he's an apostle, a servant who speaks for Jesus because he knows how glorious he is. We are a people who are chosen by God. We are sanctified by his Holy Spirit and called to be obedient to his calling because he sprinkled his own blood on us. He gave us new birth to a living hope, not one that goes away and fades with time, but a living hope that lasts for an eternity and beyond through or by the power of a resurrected Savior. And Peter said, I saw him when he was a risen Savior. I witnessed to the fact that he overcame death and so will we. And then he says, I'm going to tell you about your inheritance. That's what we read. Kept in heaven for you. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life if you're a child of God. And your name will be there as a child in his descendants list. We're children of his. And in that list of being children of his, there is an inheritance clause. There's a home in heaven for us to go and be with him. And if you're a child of God... You have a house in heaven you don't have to pay for. It's already been bought. He says in 1 Corinthians 5 that this body is a tent, a temporary dwelling place for the soul. But he has a house in heaven not built by human hands that we get to go and live in. We should be anticipating that with great, great anticipation. And he allows us to be tested so that our reaction to the trials will give him glory. That we can prove our faith in him by remaining his follower, even in difficult times. Our faith is more valuable than gold. People seek that all the time. They dig for it in this county and have for generations. But that gold will be disappearing soon. But our relationship with Jesus will not be. The result of our endurance during times of persecution is a praise and a glory and an honor to Jesus Christ, who went through more pain than we will ever understand. We in this age, verse 8, have not seen him, but we love him. Even though we don't see him now, we believe in him. And because of that, we are filled with an inexpressible, glorious joy of our salvation. Because we are receiving the end result of faith, which is the salvation of our souls. See, in the generations before, the prophets spoke of the grace that was to come. They talked about the Savior who would come. A tender shoot, grown up among us, crucified on a cross. But we're living in an age when we can look back to history and see that. But we always seem to be looking, trying to find a place where we can understand the end times. Now they did that according to this text, that they were looking in those days, wondering if the Savior would ever come. And then finally he came, they didn't see him. And we live in a time where we get too consumed with what's coming next instead of understanding the promises of God. They searched intensely with the greatest care. Trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the spirit of Christ would be. But in verse 12, he says this word, these words. It was revealed to them that they were not 
serving themselves but you, the prophets of old, when they spoke of the things that have now been told in the resurrection of Jesus, by those who have preached the gospel to you, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels longed to look into these things. And then he came. And the fact that he allowed them to wait a long period of time before he came the first time helps us to understand that in God's timing, he will come again. The crucifixion came, and with it came the glory that followed in the resurrection. We live in a great time. We already know about his resurrection. We already know about his sacrifice. We already know that the angels of heaven have watched and the prophets of old have prophesied, and each of the things they prophesied have come to pass and God is still in charge. And because of that, we can have peace knowing that we're living in the presence of the Almighty and in His control, under His protection, under His wings. When Jesus looked out over Jerusalem from the top of the mountain, He saw the people, and they were running around like sheep without a shepherd. And He said, I just wish they would come and let me gather them up under my wings, and I would just take care of them if they just let me, but they won't. But he says to us that we are under his wings, in his protection. So he tells us then in verse 13, knowing all of these things that he's talked about, he's feeding them the food they need to be strong. And then he tells them, this is what I want from you. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace of be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at, the com at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you were in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. And so God has said, I've shown you, I've, I've demonstrated it, I've come and lived in front of you, I died, I showed you how death can be overcome. And resurrection occurs. And I've shown you how it is to ascend into heaven above. His apostles saw the bottom of his feet when he was going back to his father. All of this is proof he's coming again. And when he does, he will gather up his children. The broken, the sinful, redeemed, and all mankind that belong to him. And take us home to be with him. He has revealed this first coming, and he's telling us the second one is just as true. So do not do this. Do not conform to the evil desires that you'd had when you lived in ignorance. Just don't do it. The time is short. The God of this world is out to get you. Verse 3. He has these tools to shoot at us. Selfishness, self-centeredness, greed, the me-first attitude in a whole generation. I'm the greatest, look at me, I'm more powerful, I'm good, I'm wonderful, I'm all those things, and we're not. But Jesus Christ, our Savior, is extremely, extremely good to us. And so we thank him on a regular basis. I want to read one more passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since the God of mercy, it, because of God's mercy, we have this ministry, and do not lose heart, rather we have... Renounce secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception nor distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God, even if our gospel is veiled, is veiled to those who are perishing. But those who understand, who get this story, who understand it and accept that it is no longer veiled, it is glory and something to be celebrating in every way possible. So, I don't call Simon Simon anymore. I call him Peter. Because not only did he deny the Lord Jesus Christ, but he realized when he did it, it was wrong. And he told him three times, I love you, Lord. I love you. And then Jesus said, Peter, go and feed my sheep. Jesus 
precedes sinful men and women and children and people. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming in all his glory. He's coming to redeem us and to take us home to be with him. A grand and glorious theme for us to share until he comes. So I'm asking you, if you're not ready, today's a good day to get ready. Today's a good day to obey, a good day to begin to follow. It's a good day to let him, let him be Lord of your life. It's still early because it isn't ended yet, but someday soon it will. So be ready. The Lord's coming. And Christ receiveth sinful men.